About the 5th century, when this was made, northern China and also the area around Dunhuang were both ruled by the emperors of the Northern Wei dynasty, which only lasted for about 150 years. This can be regarded as a typical relic of the Northern Wei, who were of a nomadic race, but who adopted the customs and manners of the more advanced Chinese. They also adopted Buddhism, but were eventually absorbed into the mass of Chinese who were in the majority. This Buddha of the future shared the fate of the people who created it. And this particular style is not found again in China, nor did it travel on eastwards to Japan. Cave number 285 was built about a hundred years later, during the Southern Wei period. The alcoves, which were designed for Zen Buddhist meditation, are in the same style as the Bihar caves in India. But if you look at the ceiling, you find it's covered with pictures of mythical Chinese heroes and animals. At the four corners lie guardian beasts, glaring out of the evil world. Here's a dragon with nine heads, a character in the stories of the Shanghai Sutta. Here's a legendary Chinese emperor, Hu Xi, and his empress Nu An. The Indian world of Buddhism is surrounded with characters from Chinese stories. Cave number 428 was built in the middle of the 6th century, and it has a raised triangular ceiling in Chinese style. But the pillar in the middle of the cave is like those in the Tao Miao cave in India. This mixture of Indian and Chinese elements is typical of the early Dunhuang style. Even so, these early murals sometimes seem astonishingly modern in style. When they were first seen, many people thought they were like paintings by the Fauvists, ultra-modern, in spite of the fact that they are 1,300 years old. But one solution to this mystery was found in cave number 263. Underneath a mural painted in the 11th century was another painting from about the same time as those in cave number 428. The figure was outlined with beautiful pink shading. So what looked like modern bold drawings are actually the result of the fading of the pigments caused by the light.
the road continues through the Gobi Desert to Yu Menguan, about 60 miles or 100 kilometers northeast of Dunhuang. In the second century BC, the Han Emperor Wu Di had conquered the Western lands, and Dunhuang became a place of great strategic importance on the Silk Road. Yu Menguan was a frontier area. Since those days, many other peoples have invaded this area, and many other Chinese dynasties have fought to retain it. A famous Chinese writer wrote a poem in which he said that when people had traveled 10,000 leagues westwards from Chang'an and finally reached Yu Mengguan, their hearts were torn with grief, for it seemed they'd reached the ends of the earth. Here's a part of the Great Wall that was built in Han days, still standing. Smoke signals were often used to announce the arrival of an enemy. These signals would be passed on from one signal tower to the next, until they finally reached Chang'an, about 1,200 miles or 2,000 kilometers away. The message would only take about half a day. In the later part of the 6th century, China was reunified under the Sui dynasty. The Sui dynasty was a very short one and only lasted just over 30 years. But in that time, Buddhism spread far and more than a hundred new caves were built at Dunhuang. The Sui cave builders seem to have been very fond of the triple image of the historical Buddha. The power and prestige of a dynasty that could reunite China and make converts to a new foreign religion is obvious in the lines of these statues. And you can also see evidence of contact with the Western lands in the clothing of the triple statues, and especially in the pearl string pattern. 